Um, I'm just going to shout so everyone can hear me. And um, feel free, everyone, to just congregate in the center to get a better view. So um, this is the third event in uh, the 2011-2012 SJD Association Seminar Series entitled Mapping the Globalization of Legal Education. And the idea of the event um, is to really set the stage, set the debate, define the questions um, for an upcoming large international conference that we're organizing from March 23rd to 25th here at HLS. So we have one more seminar series, um, seminar in the series, and I guess this is just a, a rule in RSVPing to admit. So I'm sorry that everyone has to sit sort of on the floor on the side, but we're very, very appreciative um, of your attendance today. So I'll just give extremely brief introductions for our three distinguished guests um, so as to save time and have to conclude um, at one or about quarter after. If you do have a class, feel free, of course, to leave right at one o'clock. So we have um, Harrison Benson, who is Professor of Law and Canada Research Chair in Transnational Economic Governance and Legal Theory at Olive Hall Law School at York University in Toronto. He is also Director of the Critical Research Laboratory in Law and Society and Co-Director of the European Union Center of Excellence at York University and Co-Founder and Co-Editor-in-Chief of the German Law Journal. He teaches and works on legal theory and global governance, globalization of the law, comparative corporate governance, and transnational governance. He um, has been educated in France, Germany, and the United States, and now lives and works in Canada, so it's a wonderful global perspective to offer. Uh, in the center, we have Fred Amon, who is also C.O. Byrne, Professor of Law at War School of Law at Indiana University, where he was dean from 1991 until 2002. He has also been dean of the Suffolk Law School from 2007 to 2009. He teaches globalization of law and writes on issues of globalization, administrative law, and legal privatization. He's also the founder of the Indiana Journal of Global Legal Studies, which he tells me this year is celebrating its 20th anniversary um, and is having a commemorative conference in April. And finally, we have Glenn Cohen, Assistant Professor of Law and Co-Director of the Petrie Fong Center for Health, Law, and Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics here at HLS. Uh, he was an honors program attorney in the appellate staff of the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Division and also clerk to Chief Judge Michael Houdin of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. He works in issues of bioethics, food and drug law, health law, um, and also the extraterritorial application of criminal law recently. Um, and so just to remind everybody, this panel is entitled um, Our Law Schools in Crisis, the New York Times article and its discontents. And so we're using that as a springboard for a larger discussion of the issue of crisis, no crisis in the U.S. and globally. So thanks very much for coming. And we will start with Professor Kwan. Great. I've got 10 minutes. But my plan is not to try and use all of them because I'm more interested in the discussion. Um, is all law schools in crisis? Well, the world is in crisis. The financial world is in crisis. And as a result, I guess there is a moment of crisis in the law schools or panic, but I think this is, you know, there's an adage, never uh, waste a good crisis, right? So I think it's an opportunity for us to rethink what we're doing. But I don't think the legal education in particular is in crisis. Rather, it's on the demand side for our graduates that we're feeling uh, a lot of pressure. Uh, we were circulated ahead of time. Most of you have read uh, Siegel's uh, NY Times, uh, Hatchet Job, I think is what I would probably call it, to be honest. Uh, and I thought, you know, the way I structured this, my thinking about it is what do I think he gets wrong and what do I think he gets right? Uh, the wrong list is longer, so I'll start there. Uh, first of all, I don't know if anyone has seen this little interview that he did for Bloomberg News. So it's clear after you read the piece that he doesn't know very much about law schools. And in fact, he says in the Bloomberg News piece that it's not even his beat. He doesn't normally cover law schools, but he was at a cocktail party where somebody was carping about uh, law school and law school education, and that's how he became interested. And so he wrote these pieces for the New York Times. So what does he get wrong? Well, he doesn't understand the difference between substantive criminal law classes and criminal procedure classes, and obviously thinks the material in one should be caught by the other. The New York Times, to their credit, did a correction at the bottom of the story on that bit. <coughs> a mistake that I think runs deeper is his focus on the sphere of influence as being the court system, right? So I would say the move in the last 40 years of legal education uh, is away from a sort of a single focus on the court system as the place where law professors talk to people who make things happen, to a much broader conversation with policymakers, regulators, uh, congressional people, NGOs, advocacy groups, and all this, right? And this is in part, I think, the function of the rise 
of Westlaw. This is my pet theory. When you had to shepherdize, none of you have been taught how to do that anymore. When you had to go to the books and shepherdize and look up cases in this very labor-intensive process, having legal scholarship that collected it for you and made sense of an area of law, the way treatises still do, was incredibly useful. And therefore, it was an incredibly useful function for law professors to do that. Well, these days, as we know from working on Westlaw, you can get all the cases really quickly, and you can get them in 17 different windows open on your computer and cross-referencing and hyperlinking. Therefore, in fact, if law professors were to do what law professors did 40 years ago and focus on that, we wouldn't be generating a lot of utility. So I think he's wrong to focus so much on the courts as the area uh, where we ought to have influence. What else is he wrong from? So this is a quote from the uh, article. Some articles are intra-academy tiffs that could interest only the combatants. Like, what is wrong with Cam's and Scanlon's arguments against Torek from the Journal of the Ethics and Social Philosophy? Okay, so I took this a little personally, because Tim Scanlon and Francis Cam are friends of mine who I do some work with here at the university, great philosophers, but a few things were wrong with this. First of all, it's not a law journal, it's a philosophy journal. <laughs> Second of all, the author is Tyler Doggett, who teaches, I looked it up, at the philosophy department at the University of Vermont, not the law school. But third, maybe more importantly, it turns out this question, which is one I've actually thought about, and I'm writing a paper that involves at the moment, is actually a crucial question for most of legal reasoning in terms of self-defense, in terms of choice of evils in criminal law, in terms of the way we distribute goods, in terms of health care. It's the question of aggregation. Can you take interests of the few that are the many that are small and aggregate them to outweigh the interests of the many? Right now I'm working on a paper on the way in which we ration legal services by pro bono uh, institutions like uh, public defender services, legal aid bureaus, uh, and comparing that to the way medicine does it. And one of the central questions is the aggregation question, of which Torex, Scanlon, CAM are important contributors. He also takes pot shots at poor Ori Herstein, who's on the job market right now, who's written on the non-identity problem. Again, cuts a little close to home because it's something I've written about, right? But essentially, he doesn't understand, I think, the way in which ideas translate into the real world, right? Here we have a philosophical problem that's tricky. It's the question about whether you can harm someone by creating them. And that is incredibly relevant because it turns out most of the regulation of reproduction that exists in the world is based on the assumption that you can. And it's only by challenging that assumption and doing it in a philosophically sophisticated way that you can convince policymakers, hopefully, that they're wrong. Uh, for example, should the US adopt uh, anonymity system, uh, anonymity revealed system for sperm donation like we have in the UK? Just written about that, a very tangible problem for which this is the important construct to understand. Okay, last thing he gets wrong, clinical education is not the solution. Clinical education is wonderful, you should do it, but, and again, I'll defer to the experts here, it's incredibly expensive on a per student basis, right? So if your concern is the cost of legal education, clinical education is not gonna solve the problem because it's not an effective way to teach skills. That's what he gets wrong. What does he get right? One thing is he says, quote, the problem is that with rare exceptions, all schools play the same scholarship and prestige game. I think he's mostly right here. There's an incredible homogeneity in the market for law schools that's really surprising when you think about it. In reality, I think there are really only three models of law schools. There's Yale, where the focus is not on teaching people to practice law, really. It's about producing legal scholarship and legal scholars. Again, you know, I call it as I see it. There is Northeastern, and other schools like it, that have a focus on a co-op system where it's about placing students in co-op positions and a real focus on public interest law almost exclusively. And then there is everybody else, of which Harvard, you know, we like to think we're the good, the, the best part of the undifferentiated product market, right? But it is really a very homogenous product market. And it's all priced relatively the same. And that piece is bizarre because if you, know, if you were buying a car and there were BMWs and there were lemons, you'd expect to pay more for the BMWs and less for the lemons. And yet it seems as though the lemons in the law school market charge about the same thing. Why is that? Well, again, demand up until recently has been incredibly strong. Another possibility that he raises, and here I don't have a good basis of information, maybe my colleagues may be able to say more, is the way in which the ABA requirements and the US News ranking system 
cause a more homogenous product and a, and a, and a huge uh, sort of investment in the scholarship game. What else do I think he's right about? I do think there are benefits to experience, the experience, the fact that people have practiced law. In my law teaching and in my law scholarship, I often draw on things uh, I experienced while being a lawyer at the Justice Department. But my sense is he gets this also slightly wrong in that the ideal is not to have a million versions of me or a million versions, God forbid, a million versions of people who have some legal experience and some not. It's rather to think about this almost from a public health perspective, a population level perspective, to say your goal in a, you know, maybe even also sabermetrics, money ball perspective, your goal is on a law faculty to have a significant bench that has experience. And that may be, again, aggregation, a little bit of experience for a lot of people, or it may be a few people who have deep amounts of experience so that you can satisfy the needs of students who want that. But you also don't want to have homogenous products in terms of faculty. You want faculty diverse. You want them to be interdisciplinary. You want them to give great offerings, right? At a school like Harvard, we're large enough that we can easily accommodate that almost by accident. There is no shortage of black letter law classes. There is no shortage of taking classes with people who spend time in government, and in fact, or private practice. We often have this wonderful brain circulation that's going on. I do think many of his criticisms have more stinging for schools towards the bottom end of the market, but that's in part because I think they're selling lemons. And I think that, in fact, the students who go there uh, are uh, acting under unrealistic expectations as to what they're going to get. And as a result, they end up quite unhappy at the end of the day. OK, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Is this on? Do I need it? It's on? OK. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have a short paper that takes uh, almost exactly 10 minutes. Uh, the New York Times call for reform comes during a time of unsteady economic recovery, rising tuition costs, ever higher, ever higher debt loads for students, and fewer legal jobs, especially high-paying legal jobs. Many firms are restructuring themselves in ways likely to outlast the current recession. But does this mean law schools are in crisis? I believe the call for reform is a symptom of a crisis situated elsewhere, and that viewing the patient from a broader perspective, the diagnosis of crisis in legal education may be misplaced. In these brief remarks, I want to make the case that law schools are and have for some time uh, been uh, in a transition driven by the transnationalization of law. In recent years, law school curricula have become both more theoretical and more skills oriented. And this is as it should be. Thus, I see the present situation within law schools not as requiring a choice between theory and practice, but ever more creative ways of integrating theory and practice. We need theory to know what our practical priorities should be. As preface, let us acknowledge, as did Professor Cohen, that um, the world is in crisis. And it would be surprising if some aspects of that more general state of affairs did not affect law schools. I am referring to the crisis of neoliberalism, the limits of which are now evident in Europe and the debates over federal expenditures here in the United States. Is there anything in this situation that poses new challenges for law schools? To this, the answer is surely yes. At a minimum, the lingering effects of the economic downturn affect law schools in three ways. The first and perhaps most obvious is the cost of legal education itself. In modern times, law schools have always had to deal with the intricacies of managing the law school university interface with regard to revenue flows and cost sharing. But now there are more intense pressures. Now refer to the challenge of maintaining broad access to the legal to legal education through financial aid as demand for aid goes up even as other needs press hard against tuition dollars annual funds and returns on endowment a second area of the downturn's impact is the volume of business for law firms at the moment and the demand for new legal talent current law school curriculum reformers both inside and outside the academy often echo employers and their clients in calling for more skills and less theory. Law firm clients are savvy customers, 
and some don't want to pay for trainees. Law firms want graduates prepared for the practical demands of practice, prepared, as they say, to hit the ground running. 20 years ago, Judge Harry Edwards sounded a somewhat similar complaint when he focused on interdisciplinary approaches to law as a diversion from fundamentals. Chief Justice Roberts has echoed this view more recently. I could not agree less with that complaint. If law firms and law schools have different priorities, we should not assume that this is a deficit on the law school side. Law firms serve today's clients. Law schools train lawyers, but we were also educating them to meet the knowledge demands of today's dynamic legal scene and well into the future. And this brings me to the third area of impact from the current crisis. The third area of change involves recent changes in law and society particularly the emergence into prominence of that complex set of developments known as transnationalism. Law is no longer the monopoly, if it ever was, of states and their internal jurisdictions. Transnationalism is radically diverse, combining domestic and international institutions as well as non-state entities, some of them, multinational corporations, as wealthy as most nations, others, vulnerable populations at the social margins, practically invisible. Markets and states are thoroughly mutually embedded. The very idea of national interest nowadays is inseparable from the state's interest in maximizing the national position in transnational flows of capital, goods, people, and ideas. Accordingly, transnational law is layered, dynamic, multi-centered, involving many purposes and calling on many different kinds of analysis. In this regard, the practical demands of the current legal scene are not what they were even 10 years ago. It, makes tremend it, it takes tremendous analytical agility to manage the multiple polycentricities and complex fusions of contemporary law that law students will face as soon as they begin their careers. Law students are coming to their professional degrees from undergraduate educations increasingly imbued with transnationalism, not only in the social sciences, such as economics and political science, but also in the humanities, literature, history, cultural studies. In recent years, transnationalism has had significant impact on disciplinary boundaries and bridges, issues of identity and rights consciousness, and the very meaning of professionalism. And the internationalization of law schools through exchanges and advanced degrees is here to stay. Suffice it to say that the transnationalization of law and legal education is an inescapable and irreversible development of the current scene. While some of the impact of transnationalism may be in the realm of intangibles, for example, felt as a shift of consciousness rather than material conditions, these developments are very real, and so are their demands on faculties and students. This is why I feel it is a mistake to pin these developments on law schools as their internal crisis. What we are experiencing is a pervasive conflict over mission. And this is not a conflict we can resolve through internal reforms alone. It involves fundamental tensions over what the law is for and what it means to be a legal professional. It points to the differences between legal education and legal training between priorities derived from the ongoing development of law as a social institution and priorities keyed to current markets for law. It entails different visions of the public as consumers or citizens. Indeed, between different visions of law's role in relation to justice. Law schools should be leading these debates. So let us broaden the horizon and consider the law school scene in a larger context. While we are hearing a great deal about reforming legal education in the direction of skills, the reality is that the demand for skills is being driven by the larger context in which transnational capital and marketization have become the major idioms of social life. Transnationalism increases law's exposure to non-state interests in ways that are pervasive and new. But transnationalism is not just a question of interests emerging between nation states or between states and non-state entities. It demands another way of thinking about law at every jurisdictional level in relation to every institution. It demands another way of thinking about the relation between the local and the global down to the level of individual personhood. For example, when a private contractor 
bidding to provide health care or food to a privatized state prison cuts back on service to win the contract. The value of each individual inmate is leveraged against the value of those dollars in the global economy. Some of these connections are empirical, with clear causes and effects. Others are interpretive, accessible by a perceptive association of circumstances. Theory and skills are inseparable precisely because the analytical demands of transnationalism are themselves diverse and wide-ranging. Some legal needs are obvious, others below the radar. There is no part of the law school curriculum that is not in some way affected by the transnationalization of law and society, especially the conventional borders between law, uh, law school subjects, such as, say, administrative law and contracts and between law and adjacent fields, whatever these might be. Law schools have ventured into interdisciplinarity to broaden their theoretical range, and they have also committed themselves to pragmatics with the rise of clinical legal education and serious legal writing programs. These go together, and both are now integral to our curriculum. The connection between theory and practice could itself be an area of innovation an innovative intradisciplinarity, reflecting the fact that we now live in a transnational world, not just a local, state, or national society. Creative capstone courses could su support students' fluency in the complex interlegalities they are learning in their courses. Skills could be integrated into theory courses in novel ways that the internet and new media make possible. Our students will practice law in a world in which the categories of our craft will not stand still. Just last week, the front pages gave us the latest round in the right to work movement and the recent human rights claim against Greece by hedge fund lenders. The real crisis today, I believe, is not in the way we prepare law students for law practice. Rather, it is the, way, <coughs> the ways uh, the transnationalization of law and society have destabilized traditions of citizenship, rights, and public life that we once took for granted. Educated and well-trained lawyers should have a major voice in what comes next. Thank you. It's ironic that um, you should have the voice, but uh, we keep on talking, so I will try to be very brief, and I have to say try because I usually go on and on, but I won't do that today. So um, the last time I was in this room here, many years ago, we had a debate between graduate students and JD students about whether we should, um, how we should think about including courses on Islamic law in a law school curriculum. And that is very similar to the debates we have now. How many courses do we add and what should you actually be learning and what would we all like to teach? Now, uh, very briefly, I will do three, I want to talk about three steps of integrating the so-called crisis of law schools in, a, in three different discourses. The first one is to talk about the concrete environment of the law school. So the law school allegedly is in crisis and the law school is separated because it seems so clear what the mandate of the law school is. And that's why it's relatively easy to issue this report card as to its illnesses and its failures and deficiencies. The law school, however, is uh, a part of a much larger undertaking, which is, uh, if you, you know, see the ripple effects, there's a university around the law school, and also there is a whole system, a support system, that uh, is publicly supported and hopefully also endorsed of higher education. So higher education has uh, also come into a crisis, and it's not a good idea to separate the so-called crisis of a law school as an isolated phenomenon uh, from a debate over why we should spend ever more money on uh, keeping up universities and what is the mandate of these universities. Just to underline that point a little, if we, some of us, teach corporate law, if we dare to introduce the students in the 10 minutes where we allow to sort of go away from the textbook material and we want to talk about whether the corporation in fact is in crisis today, then the students will, of course, find many reasons of why that is a worthwhile debate, and so we can have that for 10 or 15 minutes, and you can read everywhere that the corporation is in crisis, and it has to do with its mandate and its place in society and its accountability and its governance structures, 
But that keeps us very busy. And if we only wanted to cover the literature that's being issued around this theme from the last few years, then that's a job that you cannot give to any research assistant because you'll never come back. But the cooperation has forever been in crisis because we have to talk about what that crisis really is. And that's why some of these really crap shot assessments over law schools in crisis, I think, have to be taken with a grain of salt. So higher education is in crisis if higher education fails to deliver on what we would like um, higher education to, to do. And the we is the big issue here. Law school is a highly elitist undertaking and there's a huge ac problem of access. It's just not accessible for uh, most people to become lawyers. And that's the same for higher education. And the more we specialize and the more we um, boost what law schools actually do and what they um, can deliver and what kind of programs they offer, we actually exacerbate that gap between what goes on outside and what we do in the law school itself. So the mandate of law schools and of universities, and that I think is uh, it's relatively easy to have a consensus on, is to theorize and to teach about a world in transformation. And that, of course, there are many ways to do this. Now, the cries of what law schools should do, that they pr should prepare, you know, some time ago, myself and others, and now you, for practice out there, makes it always sound as if we could just open the window and see what that practice is. But that would now change the law school to vocational training, or it would change it to just you know, giving, you, giving us a set of rules, we learn them, we apply them. We know that that is in no way the case. But the fact that law school is extremely expensive and that we try to put so much into these three years, we make sure that we cut almost all the ties to what happened before, which is, for example, your college and university education. Now, law school is all about becoming a lawyer, and that lawyer is, again, treated as if it's an entity that we can so easily understand. And that is, of course, not the case, because everybody that teaches you and everybody that offers some of these up to 400 courses that some law schools teach now, I'm at a law school that now is reaching 300 courses. But you can only take, I don't know, eight or 12 courses per year. So you miss, you take 10% of the courses that that law school offers, you wonder, who is guiding that process? How would you make that choice of what courses you actually want to take if you can't even, um, if you can only take a few? So where do we find the space to reflect on what that practice actually really is and how we should react to it? Now, the usual approach has been that law schools engage in a frantic and breathless catch-up game. So they will hire fresh blood, they will uh, now hire PhDs with no longer just economics PhDs, uh, they will hire faculty with economics PhDs, but also now with um, a senior democracy expertise and with philosophy and history and literary studies. And they will allow these young professors to offer more and more specialized courses. At the same time, plus ça change. The main core business of the law school, which is often taken care of by the slightly more established professors, just carries on. The people that are involved, in fact, in talking about curriculum change and the mandate of the law school, those are always the same. The people that actually still have that energy to believe in that the institution could change. At the same time, it's becoming increasingly difficult to involve the others that just take care of teaching torts, which has to be done in those debates. And so the gap widens. And that is one of the things that has led to fantastic law schools, because you have fantastic course offerings. But if you look into these law schools, there's all these divisions. And they're no longer just between conservatives and progressives, but they're between those that think they teach the law and those about whom is being said they don't even teach law anymore. They do all kinds of things, but it's not proper law. And that, of course, you are, we are all part of, because these law schools just add these layers of self-description and understanding. So one proposal could be that we stop just engaging in that catch-up game and say, why don't we cap the number of courses? And that comes from me, who would always want to expand everything. But I would say, if we don't manage to change courses from the inside and actually do some of what my colleagues just highlighted, but include that in a core first-year course, then we'll never bring that debate that's raging outside and among some faculty and among some students to the core of what lawyers actually do. If you add another step, which is you would force now professors to actually really defend their new course proposals, but not only those that will add a course on postmodern theory and its impact on you know, taught law, but to say, 
that everybody that's been teaching his or her course for a long time, they have to actually put their cards on the table and submit their courses to scrutiny. That practice would, of course, rattle the cage and make more than you know, a few people relatively irritated. At the same time, it would connect them to much of what's already happening in the generation of new professors, which is young or early career researchers. They now engage in very, very, um, very, very uh, critical self-reflection on what would they like to teach and how will they go about this. So they engage in syllabus design workshops. They actually try to reflect actively on how to teach and what to teach. Established scholars don't do that anymore. And so that's why have rather less, but try to make it, to make it better. Last, last, uh, last remark. The gap between, and that, there's a lot of things you could do in faculty, and that is something that should also come from students. You should actually bring things that you see outside to which the course that you are subjected to has no relevance and has no relation, and ask how can we make these things connected. And in fact, there is a lot of evidence already of this. The uh, courses that are being taught around the country and around the world, where you show that there are, for example, transnational dimensions. These, these essays that are written about these courses are often written by students that had the idea that they felt a lot of, was, a lot of the legal education to which they were um, subjected is changing, and so they publish these essays. Last thing. So how do we um, close the gap between what graduate students do and what the other students do? That's also um, relatively easy. The world of opportunities um, to get more additional training outside of your basic law school is wide open. So JD students often are encouraged to participate in summer schools. But that's a particular little circuit um, of its own. But as you are not just cons consumers, but also, also those that are shaping that enterprise, it's quite important for you to know that there is the substantive side of legal education, but at the same, si same time, there's that design and architecture side. So that there are summer schools, and that some people are teaching them, and some other people are never teaching them. That some topics are offered, and other topics never come up. That some things are only done among a small circle of law schools and never done by others. That is not just happening. No, so you have to look a little behind the scenes how that actually, how that actually takes place. And if, uh, if you feel that there is immense, immense pressure to justify the three years of spending roughly 50,000 only on tuition every year and then have no practical training, as the alleged crisis tells us, then you have to ask, so how sophisticated is our debate actually unfolding within the law school to ask what we have to learn in order to perform better outside. And if you see how some law schools in a very breathless way adapt to these responses, then that's why I brought up the comparison between higher education in crisis and corporations in crisis. If you do corporate law, you see that nothing really changes. The questions are always the same. If you look at the higher education crisis, also those demands always seem to be the same. And we have to wonder why we keep coming into these moments of crisis and hysteria, although we totally disconnect of how long we've been engaging in these debates in the first place. And then if many law schools celebrate that, for example, Washington and Lee two years ago shifted their third year, which is the year where you usually, after your summer job, have secured what will happen in the next few years after graduation, but now can take courses that you never dared to, for example, international law and other things, or Islamic law. The third year in Washington Lee has been transformed into a no course year anymore. It's all about practical training. But the practical training that's offered there is totally disconnected from decades of thinking about how to do experiential education. It's totally disconnected from the legal pluralist informed work on how to do clinical legal education that's been going on since the 60s. The people that now teach third year contract drafting are practitioners that not only don't they, they don't care about this background, but also they didn't even know that there was that background. And that's different. You have to be aware of that background. Thank you. Uh, the question is directed to Professor Cohen. 
Uh, you started with the sort of a kind of marking ways of the word crisis. Um, I wonder whether you have changed your idea after hearing the rest of the panel talking about crisis and how you get education to be restructured. Thank you. Uh, not really, in that I think we're pretty much in, a, in agreement here uh, in that to me, the, the fact that there's a crisis is that there are people who went to law school under one set of expectations about what would happen to them who are not getting those expectations met. The reason they're not getting those expectations met has everything to do with the global financial crisis and nothing to do with anything of the law schools they went to have changed in the time that they started. Uh, and to me, that's a great time to start thinking about whether that's a problem, what we do about it and the like. But to me, I think, I think we're all in agreement on that. I don't know. Well, thank you. That, that was quite uh, interesting. So um, I just want to ask this question. So here we have people representing the legal academy that produce the lawyers. Do you think that your views in assessing from internally is sufficient? Because if you want to really discuss um, uh, the system that belongs to a larger system, don't you think that uh, we should allow others from outside, especially those who consume the legal service, tell us whether we are in crisis or not? And I'm asking this having in mind the fact that um, at the point, many people deny the global economic crisis, especially those who serve the system, saying that law is not a crisis, it's not a crisis, until a point when it can no longer be denied. So, so what is the best way of really assessing whether we are in, in, in good shape or in a bad shape? Who do we really need to listen to, apart from ourselves? That is the first one. Uh, the second one, in the intelligence and the economic cycle, we do scenario thinking. Uh, what will happen in the next 20, 30, 40 years so as to prepare ourselves for that? What do you think or what do you see happening in the legal academy in the next 30, 40 years if we continue in this direction? Thank you. So that uh, touches on a debate that has haunted lawyers um, for decades now. And one of the big moments of when that question came up was at the time where all the aspirations that the state and the law and its lawyers could actually do things that were helpful and effective for society when that began, began to crumble. And the ironic thing at that moment around the 70s was that it begins to crumble not only because it's financially almost unbearable to, to ever more boost the state and to create services that reach out to every corner of society, but it was ever more clear that neither the lawyers nor the bureaucrats or people that design any regulatory programs that they actually really knew about the society and all its steps and differentiations. So that's when the law turns away from institutionalized practice and tries to become a bit more creative. So people start to talk about reflexive law, responsive law, adapting and learning law. Now that was, you know, well meant, but who, who won out of this? So this gives rise to what many of you know, the law and society movement. That's partly also the, now on the, on the cross for being, uh, having done the wrong thing, because it theorizes too much legal practice and it deformalizes it. But the law and society movement is a progressive attempt to save the aspirations of, let's call it, the welfare state in the West. But who triumphs is the other side, the other political side. So the most successful law and society movement in the West is law and economics. That is the movement that actually understood that you have to go back to self-empowerment. You have to go back to society's abilities to govern itself. But the methodology and the theoretical framework came from a progressive attempt to rescue the welfare state. So that's why if we want to be a bit more enlightened over how to ask questions whether what we deliver to the society outside, whether that's actually doing the right thing, we have to take these experiences into consideration, no? And whether that's the turn of legal realism at the beginning of the century to turning empirical, which then had the result that many people inside the movement said that now we're sacrificing the law. You see all the crisis I just described in the 70s. It comes in waves, but the issue is always the same, no? Law doesn't know enough about the society in which it wants to be effective. So how do we render it more effective? Not just by learning how to draft contracts. Um, I'm uh, intrigued by your question of uh, how do we know uh, what, uh, what the future holds? What, where should we be looking? Uh, it's always a difficult one. Uh, 
one of the things that I think is very important is groups like this. I mean, one of the, one of the major changes in legal education in, in my career has been the expansion, the, 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 the tremendous expansion of, of graduate uh, programs from all over the world. And I can tell you my own uh, quick little biographical background in terms of how I became you know, so interested, if not obsessed, with the transnational perspective on things is it began many, many years ago when I had my first sabbatical leave and I was sitting in a, in a college where everybody was from another part of the world. And not all of them were lawyers, but many of them were, but those that weren't, it didn't matter. But when we talked, there were a lot of similarities and problems and a lot of differences and problems. And when we talked, it was, there was also a lot of concern about the humanity of issues, uh, about, about not just the technical stuff, but the humanity. And I think that's what lawyers are about, uh, what Pera was alluding to too earlier. Uh, part of this debate and this idea of, of wanting the people to be uh, more uh, uh, firm ready. I mean, one, there's the, you know, the usual law of comparative advantage. There are certain things that schools do better, and there are certain things that you can learn on the job much faster than any school can teach it. But I think there's also right now at this moment in time a kind of pressure uh, to turn law into a technocracy, uh, uh, to, to make, it, make it highly technical, uh, where the job of lawyers is to be able to read a, a provision of a lease with uh, a tremendous care, which that's important <laughs> for those doing that. But the idea of architecture, the idea of the kinds of, of, of great lawsuits that were brought uh, in the 60s uh, and, and whatnot, you know, where people had a vision of society. And, and I don't think that, that we're just talking to ourselves. I think there should be within the, acad in the academy a lot of, of, uh, of, of, of critique and a lot of discussion uh, so that, uh, and, and, and a lot of outreach, uh, uh, certainly outreach out to other disciplines, but outreach in, in other ways. Uh, and and it, diversity is the word I come to, right? Diversity in every way. Diversity, diversity, diversity. Uh, to, to generate that kind of debate uh, and, to, to, and to create that kind of uh, vision that lawyers can then act on, and that's where you need skills. <laughs> you need to know how to do something. You need to be empowered as well. Uh, and it's a big task for educators and for students alike. George Bernard Shaw said that professions are a conspiracy against the laity. That's absolutely true. The doctors have been incredibly successful in this respect, much more so than us, in ensuring undersupply and achieving very high rents. Our problem with the law schools is that we've been less successful in making sure that we limit enter, enter, and this is the cynical perspective, entry into the profession in such a way. The crisis that we're having now is a distributional crisis, right? Who is losing out? People who went to law school because they wanted to make money, they wanted to do well, they wanted to uh, become part of the landed class, join the conspiracy. If you're looking from a social welfare perspective, in fact, the oversupply of lawyers forcing the price down and the way the crisis is forced down the price of legal services may actually be a good thing. So from that perspective, if you really want to talk to people outside, probably the crisis is a great thing. Well, I was, I was just thinking, first off, I'm to, to reveal my own, uh, my own position. I'm very much for a theoretical uh, positioning of the law school. I value that extremely myself, so I don't want to be uh, misunderstood. At the same time, Professor Cohen, what you've been talking about, about the lower tier or the lower half of the law schools, I mean, there is, there is a deep question of how that could be uh, seen as anything but in crisis on all levels, whether it be the legitimacy of the institutions, the legitimacy of the, the ideologies, the legitimacy of the pedagogical model practice there. Uh, and so downloading that to students and saying, well, they were, they were misled or they, they, they didn't do their homework or whatever, I, obviously that's partially true. We can't you know, disable, you disable the question of their agency. But there is a system in place that maintained this, and this system also has some of that, uh, that that illegitimacy in it, otherwise that could not have reproduced itself to the extent that it has. So as much as I, 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 I enjoy and value the, the, the panel's opinions about how the crisis is interconnected with other phenomena, I, I, would, I would be very appreciative if in the last few minutes 
uh, you, you could put your expertise to actually identifying things of that magnitude that are serious challenges that actually are producing crisis. I mean, I could go on to three or four other crises of those magnitude, but I think that we are well served by also focusing on trying to identify some cause and effect relationships, not mechanically, but at least, you know. I, I definitely don't want to be misunderstood and placed in the blame when students choose to go to those law schools, right? As I say, they're trying to make their lives better, and that's, that's good. Uh, you know, and there is some obfuscation going on, but I also don't think it's all obfuscation or bad apples. I mean, let me tell you something, that, again, I'm not an expert on this. My understanding is that dental schools actually had a crisis very similar to what we're going through about 15 years ago. What happened? They shrunk the number of dental schools out there by about 10 percent, and they increased the scholarly output of their faculty in a way that was closer to practice, the remaining 90 percent, and also enabled grants. My guess is that we're in for a similar course correction uh, in law schools. Now, I have mixed feelings about whether I think it would be better if the 25th least good law schools by whatever uh, measure you have were to disappear, right? In that, to the extent they are filling their classes, there are people who are making decisions that their welfare is increased by going to those places. Do I think those decisions they're making are so boundedly rational or based on such improper preferences that I want to deny them the opportunity to satisfy them? I don't know that I want to go that far. Um, this, is, this is tricky. Uh, first of all, I don't think it's that easy uh, to determine um, what schools are lemons and what schools are not, uh, 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 number one. Partly for the point you've just made, that students choose to go to places and their lives develop in ways that they might not have ever developed, and, and that's what education is about. Not job placement, education. Um, number two, um, there needs to be more diversity among law schools. Professor Cohen referenced the homogeneity. Um, and, uh, and so one has to be careful that just because a school uh, doesn't engage in certain kinds of things that, that, that's, that that's a problem. Um, I, number three, what you often hear, and we'll probably hear more of this in Congress, uh, is, is that if you did away with the guaranteed loan, all right, if you took that away, then uh, people would have to make much harder decisions up front as to whether they were going to go to law school. Hope springs eternal when you go and you say, I'm going to have this debt load, but I'm going to do really well and I'll be able to pay it back somehow. On the other hand, if you got rid of that, who would be in law school? Maybe some people who have worked in, we would, in, in night schools. Now, I was a dean of in, you know, a, a top 25 school. Uh, but I also was the dean of a school that was in the fourth tier. And let me tell you something about my wonderful students there, um, the ones that did go to work for firms. There was a great, there was a great study that's going on called After the JD that the American Bar Foundation is doing. And they're trying to see where do students go after their degree and how to, we're following their career. And then now it's in its 10th year, so there is uh, really some data there. And so many students from the elite schools go to these very big firms, uh, and then they leave. And I asked, I was on a panel, a discussant, uh, with, with some of these folks who I deeply admire their work. It's a great work. And my question to them was, who stays? Who stays? Well, I'll tell you who stays. It's a lot of kids who went to night school. It's a lot of kids who had three jobs while they were going to school. So the idea of actually being well paid in a firm uh, and having only one job and working only 12 hours a day, piece of cake. <laughs> I say this because I think that that kind of elitist analysis can quickly disintegrate, and I know that's not where you're going, but it can co quickly disintegrate into an us and them as if other schools, no, you know, the thing about law school curriculum is they're remarkably similar. Uh, and, and maybe too similar, in a sense, you know. Uh, and, and people have, uh, are exposed to things and people come to it at different points in life and they may never have been able to get into a Harvard uh, or, or, or a school like that. But five years out, they're going to be partner <laughs> at some major firm and a lot of other students have chosen other things or they just, you know, didn't want to work that way or that hard. 
So I, I'm, I'm very conflicted by that kind of question. It's, a, it's far more complicated. And, and I come back to this one point. It's about education. And you take people where they start. And not everyone starts in the same place. And, and so yeah, I, I think one has to be focused more on the substance and, and opportunity and diversity and ideas and critique. Sounds very academic, but I think it's also very practical. So I was just curious, following up on that economic point, um, especially about the loan guarantee situation, which is kind of unique to the United States legal market. Uh, I was curious, you, you started to sort of mention the sort of people you think would still go to law school if we didn't have federal guarantees for uh, professional school loans. Um, and I would throw in on top of that, on top of the federal guarantee for loans, there's the issue of non-dischargeability and bankruptcy. Uh, I'd say those are two probably the biggest uh, contributors to distortions in the market price for law schools. And so I'm curious, I mean, you seem to be alluding that uh, people from different classes or, or other diverse backgrounds wouldn't be able to, uh, excuse me, to get access to law school. Uh, I'm curious if you think that's still the case, if they would be able to attend law schools where they could demonstrate either a, a loan repayment assistance program that would allow them to take lower paying jobs, that they could still carry the loan burden that was established by the tuition at the school, or that they could establish that there was some sort of probability of getting uh, a certain income after graduation that would support that loan repayment. So I'm just curious if there's a social utility to having uh, a number of different kinds of like, <coughs> education, why should there be this disconnect between that and the pricing, and also the way that those burdens are protected by the law after graduation? Well, because people fall off the demand curve. Uh, human beings fall off of demand curves. And now, one of the things I struggled with as, as dean was finding the kind of financial aid that would enable talented students to have access to education. Now, of course, one uses that to compete for the top students, and all of that comes into play. But so often, you, you, you run into students who, who don't have the wherewithal, and, and, and they, they do fall off. Now, uh, you know, to say up front to someone, um, okay, you're too poor to come here, but if you, what do you sign on the dotted line and say, I've got, I'm working on an agreement that uh, I'm going to take a lower paying job uh, to do something that I might not particularly want to do when I finish school, you know, it's, <laughs> there's a logic to what you say, but, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if there's uh, that much reality to it. So, I, I Maybe it wouldn't happen, you know. Maybe, maybe some of the students I've seen find ways, you know. They, there's something they want to do, and, th and they find, and they stay out of school. This, of course, you see this happening much more, perhaps, with some people here, where they simply say, all right, I'm going to work for two or three years and save like crazy. So I, I, don't, I don't reject, <laughs> you know. There are other, other ways uh, of, of doing it. But uh, uh, I, I, I think you can't be so focused on just the, the income side. I, I think the uh, equality uh, aspect of education is another uh, important part of this country. <laughs> and, and I think it's in jeopardy. You know, I think it's in jeopardy. Uh, you know, it, it's danger. You know, we're, it, it, I don't know how it plays out. I worry about it. I'm not sure the market, the market can't uh, fix everything. We may disagree on that. Did you have a question? I was wondering uh, if uh, all three of you, whether you think that the requirement uh, of a three year law school in order to take the bar exam and practice law should be more. I could say more about the detail of time, I should tell you. I would say probably not, although I'm very interested, and maybe Pierre could talk about this, about whether, in fact, the articling requirement in Canada is a good idea. Now, again, I think it's a great idea for the firms. They love it. And it's kind of amazing that we haven't had that imposed by the firms on our students. The articling is the so-called fourth year, um, or the first year in practicing after three years. But that's in erosion now, because there's not enough articling positions. And that's why the pressure is now even higher to put more practice into legal education. Uh, since I've now been the person who always just said, well, 
this is not new. Let me just also do this on this point, because it's relatively important that we see that there were extremely you know, big attempts and years of studies committing, uh, committed by many, many people trying to bring more practice into the, three, into the three years or in Europe four or five years of legal education and how that would play out. And I don't know what we are to make of the fact that after more than 100 years of trying to do that, we still come back to the same issues. Should we get rid of year number three or should we get rid in Europe? It's two years after legal education that you have to do in order to become then eligible even as a judge right away after law school. So I don't know. I, that's why you know you just asked a question and then you said for a time you don't speak more. But what's the answer? Because I why would we? Have to have to is because we have a cartel. The cartel is of course maintaining its own market power. That's why we've had this discussion for 100 years, and that's why I've all sorts of problems follow from it. Oh, perfect. I mean, to many problems, the easy answer would be get rid of the requirement of law school. Let the students decide whether it's worth going to a school. I would conjecture that some will decide it's much better for them to do one year sort of far in class. Others will still go to law school for three years, maybe for two years. You know, now, why do we have Williams and Lee uh, doing this one year practice here? Because it's not possible for a student to say, I want to go to law school for only two years and then work at the firm. It's just not allowed by the regulations, or at least not directly, you have to period and so on, which is not Although, by the way, that Professor Spalman technically joined the faculty in January, so he's in the safe space in terms of the cartel. Go ahead. But isn't it, I mean, we should, we should uh, that should give us pause for a second, that really complex issues over what should law schools do, but also what does it mean to be a lawyer today, and how could that be, how could such a person be educated, but then say maybe we should slice off one or two years of that. If we, I mean, we're in a position, in a very privileged position, to actually reflect a little on what we do during that time. And if we find now that we don't do enough to get people ready to do this, to do their work in a proper way, but also to find ways to stop this hysteric hike of tuition fees, because that's just, it's insane that now if Yale is 50, this is 46, that's just a bit too much. But we get lawyers educated, and, well, I have to say this now, because I, you know, speak the German accent, but I'm in Canada, so we get educated, we educate the lawyers for 19,000, and no, they do okay, they, they know things. And we use three years in which we try to bring as much self-reflection on what it means to be a lawyer in as we can. So three types of lawyers come in, and that's our problem still. The sharks, they already go into law school, that's the stereotype of the law student who basically knows why he or she goes to law school and that's why he or she chooses the courses that we offer for them. The saint, the crim law and human rights type, and then there's this group who's just pretty smart but doesn't really know what will happen, the engineer. And the opportunity now is to move away from this 19th century idea that there are these lawyers that are just really bright and logical, as if this had anything to do with logic, and now to make sure that we reflect a little that a lawyer is now a regulatory governance architect and that he or she has to operate in dif really difficult situations and to sh shave off a year or two to say it's enough to learn ci civil procedure to become a lawyer, that's such a self-defeat, you know, let others burn our law schools down, but why would we do that before we do our job properly from inside? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll take one more question um, from Daniel so In the 19th century, I think, especially in the US, law schools were largely focused on local laws, state laws. In the 20th century, they started to become national law schools probably as a result of the understanding that some of the main problems in the country could not be solved only by local legislation. And what we see now in the 21st century is that several issues that seem to grasp the attention of uh, politics um, in the US and abroad are issues that no longer only affect one single country, like environmental questions, financial crisis, agricultural issues, international trade. Isn't that an indication that in the 21st century law school should go global? If yes, what is the first requirement or the first measure that should be taken in order to foster this, this direction of change? <laughs> um, well, uh, I, I agree with 
you know, this progression that you're outlining, I mean, it's, it, 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 it's, it's complicated, of course, but uh, uh, um, uh, I think one of the, one of the, I think there will be a new competition uh, among law schools. Uh, and, you know, when I look back, um, in addition to the progression that you describe, um, in the mid-70s, uh, it was the first time that women uh, came to American law schools in any numbers. It transformed, uh, certainly, American law schools, both in terms of the quality of the student body, the largeness of the pools, the numbers of applicants, and whatnot. I think the first thing that we're going to see happen is schools are going to put together a kind of, of transnational curriculum that appeals to students worldwide. And as the, you have a downturn uh, in applicants uh, for various reasons, uh, um, uh, you're going to see a pool of applicants uh, f that is more transnational in nature. And I'm not just talking about graduate students now, I'm talking about JDs. But they don't want to go to a school that isn't going to give them, just like in the old days, they didn't want to go to a school that didn't give them a national market. Now they don't want to go to a school that doesn't give them a a transnational market. And so they're going to look for, for schools that can do that uh, substantively as well as through their networks. So I, 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 think, I think that, that in many ways a lot of graduate programs will morph into JD programs. Uh, and it won't just be American schools. I mean, you look what's going on now. You've got a, a school in China. You've got the Jindal School in, in India. Uh, you've, you've, you, you know, Australia, I mean, uh, you know, is, is doing extraordinarily interesting things. I think there's a whole rearrangement of, of the elite schools uh, that, that's going to occur. Uh, and, and the student body is going to change, uh, you know, not overnight, but it's already changing, you know, when you look at not just graduate programs, but JD programs. So, but the schools that have something that could offer people the ability to to work on those kinds of issues here and elsewhere are going to be the schools that will be <laughs> at the top of, oh, God, the U.S. News and World Report if they're still going, <laughs> you know, 30 years from now. Fantastic. Thanks so much.